So before before we start, I just just wanted to make a very special uh, thank you to Fernanda Peter. This has also been uh, <laughs> this has also been like the developments of a nice surprise. As I said, Jan and I have been developing the program for a while, and it pays off because then you get to know people. It's it's very nice. Uh, we wanted to to invite Lucas Bambosi, who's uh, who had an excellent exposition here very close at the mark, Solastalgia. It's this new concept by an Australian philosopher. It's a nostalgia that happens uh, when when the landscape changes because of, of, of many, many, many things. And Fernanda was the curator of this exposition. And then we were in contact and then we discovered her own research, which she will also present today some bits, I think. So thank you very much for, for, for being here. Just wanted to say. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, todes, todes, todes. I just continue where you left off, and I wanted to also welcome um, all the three speakers of this panel, and in particular welcome Fernanda Peter, who is an art historian and assistant professor at the Museum of Contemporary Art of the University of Sao Paulo. She has a huge experience and um, in the relation of research and museums and in museums and um, the uh, making of uh, exhibitions. She's currently a project leader um, for the Brazil team of the Decay project funded by the Reichsbank New Williamsfonds. She has been a, um, a fellow for the FAPESB, which is the local funding agency, and had, had held various other fellowships around the globe, really, including Norway. She's been a senior cura um, curator of the Pinacoteca de São Paulo, curated several exhibitions there. The most recently, nobody would have believed it. Alain Cohea and 10 contemporary artists. She also worked as a curatorial um, coordinator of Vexor, we know, curated by Naina Terena. And I could name uh, many others. She has really passed through many um, really relevant institutions. So welcome. Our second um, person that I want to present very briefly, since we have guests here also, is Flavia Mirelis. She is a a senior fellow of Missila, thematic fellow um, this year of Missila, and an artist and professor for ethnic racial relations at a graduate program of the Federal Center of Technological Education in Rio de Janeiro. She holds a PhD in communication and culture from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro as well. She was a visiting, um, before joining Missila, she was a visiting fellow of the Center for Transforming Sexuality and Gender at the University of Brighton. Equally, she has um, a large range of research um, interests in Latin America, Abio Yala, uh, politics of race, gender, and sexuality in the arts, and countercolonial and decolonial feminism. I also skipped the um, publications here, but welcome also to you. And last but not least, our first speaker, um, Jörn Etzold, is professor for theater studies at Ruhr University Bochum and senior fellow of Missila this year. He has published very widely on Situationalist International, Walter, Walter Benjamin and Friedrich Hölderlin, on layers of theater history, figuration, and chorus, political and anti-political theater. His most recent interests were in theater and performance in post-industrial environments, aesthetics of infrastructure, and the relations between theater performance and law. He is currently a PI of the research training group, the, demo, um, the documentary Access and Privation, both based at Ruhr University. It's a great pleasure also to have you here at the panel. The three presenters will speak one after the other, each for 20 to 25 minutes on the topics that are named in the program. And I hand the word over to you, um, and Jörn. Before I do that, though, one last remark. Astrid Uyua was in the program also. Unfortunately, for health reasons, she can't join us, neither pre in present nor online, and we wish her um, well, that she gets better soon. So okay, that explains you. why we're short, and so we try to end at 4.30 anyways. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction to my... Thank everybody for, for the nice words. Thanks, Michel Mintefering, for being here. And of course, thank you, Thomas, because I have to stay. We, we are like conceiving this together, but he did most of the work. It's just like that. He was writing all the emails, and uh, so this um, it has been a great pleasure. It would not be a great pleasure to work with you because you did all the work, but it's been a great pleasure to... <laughs> I'll get out of this <laughs> to do this together, and I'm very grateful that you also took so many of the organizational 
um, issues here. Um, okay, today I will not speak about the Russell Tribunals or the Permanent People's Tribunals I'm working on here, Miss Seela, but about the region I will go back to. Shortly, I didn't expect one of our deputies, not, not mine, I'm, I live in Witten, but one of our deputies <laughs> here. Uh, this is very, this is really a funny coincidence. The Ruhr area, North Rhine-Westphalia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 beautiful city beautiful. Uh, in, in Germany. It's a former coal mining area. And of course, we can discuss if the term extractivism um, is appropriate when talking about a region in Western Europe, where a lot of things are different from Latin America, where the term extractivismo was, has been coined. I will a bit address these differences. However, also in the Ruhr area, the large scale extraction of raw material altered landscapes and irreversibly changed the existing social relations and invented others. I tend to believe Silvia Federici when she states in Caliban and the Witch that the methods of capitalist control, domination, extraction of bodies and all the other goods of the earth have been applied to Europe and the Americas in the same movement and that parts of the pre-capitalist social fabric in Europe might not have been that different from what the colonizers found sometimes idealized or often demonized in the Americas or Pierre Clastre, who describes ethnocides first with an example of the extension of the state of France to the Languedoc. Those examples are long ago, but still all, all, also in Europe, we have, we have uh, different regions with very different, um, very different social structures. And uh, Europe is not only, does not only consist of, of metropolis like Berlin or Frankfurt. There are a lot of other regions where also today extractivism still takes place. And all from the beginning, Uh, of the of the conquista, a lot of Carl V credit was paid with the mining license in Spain and so on. So this also has its history in Europe. Um, in any case, when commodity extraction left, or when it moved on or away from the Ruhr, um, it left altered landscapes and a social fabric that had had and still has to confront what Mary Dudley called the trauma of deindustrialization. Especially, I'm interested in the role of arts and aesthetics in a larger sense here in two ways. On the one hand, former sites of coal mining and steel production are since the 1990s transformed into museums, theaters, concert halls. What is the role of art here? On the other side, when deprived from the former function, the remnants of extractivism can be perceived in a different way. No, they can maybe tell us something about the relation to the world inherent extractivism, about the drive that fuels it, the desires, fears, and assumptions that can make it happen. And here I will sketch very briefly and try to shorten it. I, I'm afraid I'm still a little too long. I, at the end of it, I will ha have a look if everybody's still on board and that I, how much I have to shorten on, on the go. Um, so I will sketch briefly some thoughts that bring together Cornelius Castoriadis' theory of a social imaginary with the theory of artistic volition It's inter in invented by Alois Riegel and then developed by Wilhelm Woringer and, of course, Walter Benjamin. So first, the Ruhr area. What's the Ruhr area? It's an artificial landscape of scattered settlements and post-industrial nature in the far western part of Germany. It's here, over there, Duisburg, Essen, on the left, uh, Dortmund, the area there. Large areas of the region were essentially rural until the 19th century, where an expansion of the coal and steel industries around 1900, 1890 caused a steep rise in population. Whole cities, including Gelsenkirchen and Oberhausen, mushroomed with infrastructure coming later on, just like here in the suburbs of Sao Paulo, as described by Teresa Caldera in City of Walls. Large numbers of workers in the region's mines and pits came from what was then Polish part of Prussia, And they were German citizens, so they were also quite well paid, but also suffered discrimination as a result, but still formed the social tissue of the rural area, their descendants, a lot of people there have Polish names. The era has always been governed from beyond its own borders. It never formed a political unity. Its name, Ruhr area, Ruhr region, Ruhrgebiet in German, is therefore more or less unofficial and used by several institutions more or less close to the now picturesque, ah, here's the Ruhr area again, now the picturesque river, that's the Ruhr, for which it was named. Beautiful. Huh? The river forms, it is, forms the region south of border, where the mining began. And it was there that, the, as it was there, that the coal could be found 
on the surface and most easily accessed. The load becomes deeper as one progresses north, a fact that has drew the mining industry northward over time. However, that river then transverses the huge mines and pits in the north is not the Ruhr, but the Emscher. So we can also speak of the Emscher region, and this is how it looks like now. Just some photos. I mean, I had to take photos I had on my, on my computer while I was here. This is, but this is, uh, I think this is Herne. I think this is, it is Herne. Anyway. <laughs> so the two rivers play different roles. The Ruhr has always served the region's need for fresh water. More or less well, considering no living being could be found in it around the turn, turn of the 20th century. A huge infrastructure of barrier lakes in the hinterland was built to ensure water supply. The Emscher, by contrast, has been the region's gutter. Unstable soil and ground instability from the mines made underground pipelines impractical, so sewage was pumped directly into the river. This is the Emscher today, uh, crossed by a, by a, by a canal. Um, after the re-naturalization, um, as you say in German. As yet, as early as 1958, coal tips in the rural area began to fill up due to a lack of demand, an early sign of the impeding, impending coal crisis. The year 1963 saw 13 pits closed and 10,000 miners dismissed. The new sources of energy were oil and nuclear power. The rural region of the 19th century was a, a, a society in which men did dangerous work in groups and had to look after one another simply to survive. They also did so with the help of animals. Canary birds fainted before them and warned them of deadly carbon monoxide. Coal miners were trained and well organized, and they had the power to switch off the energy supply that emerging uh, modern societies depended upon. As Timothy Mitchell argues, the threat of energy shutdown gave workers the leverage to fight for their rights, and in a larger sense, enabled mass democracy in the first place. It's a book, Carbon Democracy, which is in places where workers had the power to switch off energy. The work of the miners, for example, was also partly fueled by sugar from Brazil, and here it was much more difficult to turn off the switch from one moment to another. In the moment, meantime, women usually stayed at home, took care of the children and the elderly, grew vegetables, and raised goats in their garden while the remainder of the time was spent looking out of the window. The European steel and coal and steel community, because of what now is the European Union, was uh, founded after the Second World War to prevent other wars to come, but also, as uh, so along, according to Mitchell, to create a greater coal market and reduce national coal unities, unions' ability to strike. Uh, the market is European, and so the, the national unions have uh, less, less power. The so-called Marshall Plan, officially the European Recovery Program, enabled the race of an oil-based economy. This oil was extracted in the Middle East and in other areas with a much lesser concentration of population around the extraction sites, reducing the risk of a general strike and hence the need for democracy to nearly zero. The same went for nuclear energy. Hence, according to Mitchell, the name of the game was no longer democracy, but economy. New lifestyle, lifestyles aimed at consuming as much oil as possible had to be invented. Demand for cars, motorcycles, youth culture, cosmetics, rock music, tourism, new gender roles. Here's the exhibition uh, a friend of mine or colleague of mine made on oil and on Wolfsburg, uh, beauty and horror of the, of the uh, age of petrol, photo by William Eggleston. You, know, you see the airplanes and the drink has also, also some, some uh, it looks like oil. New infrastructures had to be built, highways to outer suburbs, the lifestyle that the French call metro boulot du dos, you live outside in the suburbs, you come to work. Nobody cared about global warming, and energy never seemed in short supply. It was only in 72 that the Club of Rome issued the famous limit to growth, the report on the danger of exponential economic and population growth with a finite supply of resources. The oil crisis, the first oil crisis began in October of the following year. With oil and nuclear energy seemingly inexhaustible, an inexhaustible supply, a circumstance that, as early as 94, prompted Georges Bataille to identify the waste of energy as any economy's final goal. That's what he says in this general economy. All economy is about the waste, the waste energy has got to go away. That's when the atom, the atom age came, and where the, all the oil came in. That's where, where he has it from, I say. 
So at this moment, coal extraction in Western Germany became less and less profitable. The gigantic sites and infrastructures that had been built to enable it were on the verge of becoming useless. Reacting to this, the state government of Northern Westphalia approved the Ruhr Development Program in 68 and called for a flexibilization of the region's economy, um, a promised progress in the nuclear energy sector, better infrastructures, streets, urban railways, the development of city centers or sub-centers, and so on. This is interesting because this program was based on the, on the premise that the region should continue to be inhabited, which was anything but a given. When my university, the Ruhr University in 62, when it was funded, there had been huge discussions also in the parliament, if it's not a mistake, because it would attract people to the region, but you have to, sh to, to, to chase them away, uh, it's because the, the area, the area is, uh, uh, is polluted. So there's, there's been a long discussion. And until now, it's been the first uh, in institution of higher education there. The idea was always workers do not need uh, higher education. Uh, because uh, they get too organized if they if they know all this and they start to read all this uh, subversive literature. Um, what more, the extraction has caused a dramatic sinking of large parts of the northern rural area. And here's a map from the from the VATS that uh, we shall be figuring out. But you see in blue is all this would be lakes. This is a region populated by five million people and what is that's the blue here would be underwater because this, the soil has sunk so dramatically that now pumps are running day and night to pump all the water away. And they have, of course, um, uh, extra pumps. If, the, uh, if, if there was a blackout, a complete blackout, I think it would take three or four days for those lakes to be flooded. And those pumps are paid by money that um, the coal companies, they are responsible for it. They have demerged their profitable parts to pay, to pay the so-called eternal debts or eternal burdens, uh, the so-called Ewigkeitslasten. Very poetic word. It's called like this, the official word, the eternal burdens, the eternal depths of extraction. But the program in 68 left no doubt, if the region must continue to, be at, exist, to exist, it should be developed. Some months earlier, in the same year, the busy year of 1968, it was a Dusseldorf-based concrete poet and artist, Ferdinand Krivet, who proposed another but nevertheless, rather related agenda. His splendid manifest Glück auf. Glück auf is the, the, the minus, uh, hello, uh, that's what they say. Uh, um, the manifest called for a restructuring of the Ruhr area into a work of art. While the government was thinking of new infrastructures and industries, Krivet called on painters, sculptors, architects, urbanists, technicians, engineers, psychologists, sociologists, politicians, unionists, poets, musicians, filmmakers, directors, workers, entrepreneurs, and all those whose creative imagination exceeds the walls of museums, libraries, and concert halls to help create, I quote, a project for a composition made of cities, streets, traffic routes, seas, forests, and so on. This project consisted in the aestheticization of the useless sites and infrastructures that were already there. Krivet says the abundant mines and conveyor plants, furnaces, silos, machines, and factories allow for the aesthetic contemplation for the very first time. He dreamed of climatized conurbations of the near future, where heaps would be transformed into color pyramids, furnace where fire would meet light towers and projections, and helicopter services would provide an overview of the spectacle. Once again, Energy was not a choice. But, ah, yes, sorry, sorry yes, let's grieve it. <laughs> Thank you. From Dusseldorf. <laughs> so always, those projects always come from Dusseldorf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Dusseldorf comes up. Where would you Dusseldorf? Okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so, Perhaps Krivet had in mind the latrist and situationist experiments, those of Ivan Sheklo of Constant. I won't, I've worked a bit on this, as, 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 as Tillman said. They also, they had this, new, uh, this restructuring of, of, of love, everyday life through the oil boom. Uh, now the suburbs, this is Sarcelles in France, the new lifestyle, you know, living somewhere, going in the city, the city has become deserted, all this, and they dreamt of this, this strange city, this Constant. Uh, um, uh, creating this new Babylon cities. I, I won't uh, go on this, but it's very close, but Krivet was not a revolutionary. He was really from the Ruhr area. He wanted everybody to come in, Rhenish capitalism, and they worked together, they built boards, and then it's going to be better. 
So in 68, two strategies for restructuring economic and social infrastructures come together and both ask for development. The state government touted a program whereby new infrastructures would be built, the economy would be transformed, new jobs would be created, and Krivet underscores the role art would play in the process of transformation. Art would help the post forest society develop. In the air-conditioned theme park that once was an extractivist bone mill, a new service-oriented oriented workforce would be busy improving their personalities and brushing up their soft skills. This an article, I've contrasted this now, this idea of development with the idea of maintenance, because everyone, every, every time one, one says, talks about development, the question, who does the maintenance afterwards? And it's a very important issue for the artist, wonderful artist, Mary Lerman Eukelis. But I, I have to switch this because I will speak a bit about the aesthetics again. That's her work, Touch Sanitation, where she shook the hands of every um, sanitary worker in New York. Everybody who's interested can look, can ask me, it's published in this book. I have to skip this and go to the next chapter because what's interesting, innovation into non-innovative milieus, that Krivitz call for a restructuration of the Ruhr into a work of art became some kind of reality 20 years later, at least partly in the International Building Exhibition, EBA Emscher Park, um, headed by visionary urbanist Karl Ganser under the State Minister of Housing and Urban Development, Christoph Zöpel. Held between 89 and 99, its scope included the ecological restoration of the Emscher system, the construction of a sewage canal beneath the river, we've seen it before, and the pumping station, like it took 30 years to, to, to pump all this water away. It's opened now, two years ago, planned in 89. And of course, this um, restoration of the river was completely artificial. The river would go anywhere, never find its own bed. It's like they're very modeling it. It's an artificial reconstruction of, of what the riverbed was, uh, according to sources. Um, but even more visible was the restaging and revitalization of industrial ruins. The first part of a landscape park created in the former ironworks of Duisburg Nord opened in 1949 and has been extremely popular ever since. So families go there, have picnic and uh, hang around. Um, before that, it served as a setting for Christoph Schlingensief's German Chainsaw Massacre. You know the film from 1990 where East Germans coming to explore the West after the fall of the war, are slaughtered and transformed into sausage in the Motel Deutsches Haus, which has been shot here on, on scene in Duisburg. As a direct result of the eBay Emscher Park, the era celebrated the first Ruhr Triennale Festival, an art and music festival held in three year cycles in 2002. Artistic director Gérard Mautier, innovator in the field of opera, musical theater, commissioned creations for the gigantic machine halls and blower plants. The Hallmark project saved the Zeche Zollverein colliery, this one, an industrial complex in Essen that once was the largest in the world from demolition. Zöpel tells him, he got, he got a phone, tells him in an interview, he had a phone call on Christmas and he didn't know what to do. And then he decided, alone with his family under Christmas, he decided, no, it has to be transformed in a museum. It was Rem Kohlhaas who made all these plans. I, I skipped this a bit. But um, this is now, there's a choreographic center, there are uh, design places, there are museums. There's the Ruhr Museum with this very famous staircase. And what you do not see at the first moment when you go there is that where, this, where the staircase ends, that's former ground level. That's pre-industrial ground level. It's, it's, what you also do not see, there are the, the land, landmarks, huge art installations on the, on the, on the, in the heaps, on the, on the dumps. Um, they have become tourist attractions, but there are some dumps uh, burning from inside. Because the coal, because of the pressure, the coal is still burning. You cannot distinguish, uh, extinguish it because it would explode. And carbon monoxide, so you, you cannot go there, otherwise you die. So they have to monitor it because if, if the tourists die on the tourist attraction, it's not, not the best idea either. <laughs> so this is the very ambivalent and there. You put art on it and still the, the earth is, is burning under, underneath. You cannot, you cannot do anything about it. Um, so what Kohl has said is, the program of the new buildings and reprogramming of the existing buildings contain many functions, most of which are related to art and culture. So the buildings or the mine dumps are hardware, the old system software can be replaced by a new one and art and culture will reanimate the well-preserved ruins of an industrial past. But this is important, this reprogramming was also aimed at social relations 
subjectivities and people as infrastructure, to quote Abdul Malik Simon. In um, uh, one of the uh, urban sociologists involved in the EBR Amsha Park, um, Heise Rose Kilper, quotes two other people called Heusermann and Sieben and says, well, the task of all this is how to bring innovation into non-innovative milieus. So how can we change like this old non-innovative working class people into innovative subjects? No longer hampered by a strict regime of scheduled work shifts and strongly gendered labor and without both the severe working conditions and the solidarity and comradeship that the mines, factories and industrial residential centers demanded and afforded, every one of the region's inhabitants was now uh, expected to look after themselves. They were to be transformed into what Michel Foucault in his analysis of German Austrian post one neoliberalism called the subject of interest. Some books on it, Boltanski, Chad Quello, of course, Brianna Kunst, Art at Work, John McKenzie, Performer Else, a little book I've written with some friends, Artworks, Aesthetics of post fordism So just as Krivet anticipated, the acidization of no use as infrastructures would soon play an important role in bringing innovation into non-innovative milieus. The eliminated carbon buyer plants and furnaces were meant to instill pride and a sense of identification with the region and promote a feeling of togetherness. Sites of extraction were transformed into civic cathedrals, in which Ruhr Triennale director Willy Decker promised to explore in the 10 to 2009 edition the tension between art and creativity and the primal moment of religiousness. But this religion would need to dwell in the hearts of otherwise entrepreneurial subjects. Dance performances and cultural events were organized to help new subjects develop their emotional and collaborative skills and find out more about their interests. In a similar way, albeit as early as 57 and using a completely different vocabulary, Gilbert Simondon had hoped that the thermodynamic era, which he considered as a violation of nature, would yield a new era of regulation and information technology that increases negantropy or negative entropy that delays the de degeneration of the universe. So I got a sign that is much longer than I rehearsed. It was really, was really so long until now. Okay, I could, I could stop. I, I do this just to say what I would have done because I'm not sure that this era we have reached, that we've reached this era of regulation and information technology. Or if more precise, maybe we have reached it, but it didn't really put an end to the thermodynamic era, the age of extracting and burning remnants of prehistoric organic life. Extraction moves thus moved on or continue to take place in other places. Maybe the thermodynamic era and the era of regulation and information technology are much more intertwined. This can be an insight derived from Martin Aboleda's analysis of Chile's neoliberal economy of extraction in his Marxist planetary mine. Regulation in the sense of regulatory politics, the state violently sets a frame for free economy, for the development of free economy and extractivism might work very well together. Okay, what I finally wanted to do, I will do this, is um, examine, maybe we can do this later, I don't, I don't know, uh, or you can ask me about it, I can send you the text. Uh, what, okay, when Krivet says, there's gonna be some kind of theme park, what are the other sentiments, aesthetic sentiments? Here's a work by, by, um, by Douglas Gordon, um, Silence, Exit, Deceit at the Rue Triennale. What is this uncanniness, this, um, this shudder, this dizziness, this violent feeling that you get when you walk into the sites? Where does it come from? And I would say, and then I would read Walter Benjamin, Arcade Project, it has to do with a very strange constellation of time. That there's a time of progress in a rent in it, time of an ever progressing humanity, white Europeans, as uh, seen in, in the idea of thermodynamics, irreversibly. But this is related to the extraction and burning of heaps, un, 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 unimaginable heaps of unorganic matter that has been there to much, much earlier before any human being uh, appeared on Earth. And this, 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 this relation between some kind of, of cosmic time and some time of the idea of, 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 of irreversible progress, I think, becomes manifest in the, in the, in the uh, let's say, the aesthetics, the ornamental aesthetics of those buildings.
But as I got it, I have no time for this. And if you want, I can send you the text, <laughs> this one. Um, yeah, that's how it looks like. So it's a, I don't know what it's called in English. Um, Coke's oven, Coke, Coke oven. Okay, so let, let's, let's stop here. That's lithium, that's from another earlier version, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm terribly sorry that time is against us. Um, I pass the word on to Flavia. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now the, I thought this was the other the, program. The no? technical part. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Now it goes. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Oh, we had another mm -hmm. one. I was before her, but it's okay. Okay, so it's not only time against. There's also different versions of the program. That's why the order is different in everybody's program. Okay. Desculpa, mas tem toda a confiança que vai dar tudo certo. Eu não tenho tanta, mas vamos lá. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, especially Tomas and Jorn, for the invitation. And yeah, I'll, I'll go straight to the text, not to lose myself in time. Um, okay. To fully grasp the deeper senses of both indigenous relation to earth, land, and their art artistic practices, it may be productive to begin by just opposing this perspective to a global scenario of predatory extractivism. Setting the scene is important so we can move forward or slide from binary simplistic oppositions and shed light on the way setting a scenario can also make us aware of our practical conditions, highlighting queries that shift according to our position. Moreover, setting a scenario emphasizes some points of view that are also standpoints. This talk is divided into four parts, where the scenario are scenes one and two, followed by two art projects, one by Wapishana artist Gustavo Caboclo, and the second by the Baniwa community from Amazonas State. In the third part, I will briefly meditate on time dimensions, either from Western colonial capitalist divided and accelerated time and non-Western configurations of time. And lastly, I conclude by standing for an active listening as a strategy to navigate this complex and unequal scenario. So scene one, to begin with, I call predatory extractivism, activities that are related to maintaining the plantation system in its ne neoliberal phase, which can be described as an intensification and acceleration of extractivism, responding to financial demands, monoculture, dispossession of both lands and communities, processes of commodification, and racial capitalism, as depicted by actors such as Denise Ferreira da Silva and Achille Membembe. It differs them from small-scale extractivism, and it refers to a globally connected world where former colonial territories have renewed their places as site of explorations of so-called natural resources and land and people dispossession. I'm talking about then financed markets eating the earth, as David Kopenawa puts it, referring to white people's Western rationality as a hegemony on earth. In this scenario, what once were seen as productive forces from a traditional Marxist perspective are now openly destructed forces worldwide as the becoming black of the world an increasing population whose humanity is questioned, surveilled, and objectified, such as migrants, refugees, non-white people, etc. Mbembe analyzes blackness as a contemporary paradigm in a neoliberal globalized financial capital and in a context of rising digital technologies and new forms of extraction, such as data mining. Mimbembe also talks about a decentralized Europe where a geopolitical transformation is tuned to Asian markets and new players, such as big tech companies, something Medraza and Neyuso call neo-extractivism. 
these authors also signed to material extractions producing narratives of dispossession and forced displacements of lands, and I quote them. Tales of dispossession and displacements are the flip side of the expansion of extractive activities. Indigenous groups are often the protagonists of these tales, sometimes negotiating benefits around the edges of extractive enterprise, but always seemingly ending up on the vanquished side. End of quotation. The indigenous struggles are the oldest in Brazil, or Pindorama, and they have taken on a new tone with the arrival of agribusiness. We can also mention the Aliança dos Povos da Floresta in 1980s, an articulation between rubber tappers and indigenous people in the Amazon region of Acre. Also worth mentioning is the landless movement, which has been fighting for more than 30 years. Other examples are resistance to the work and effects of mining in the areas around the Rio Doce in Minas Gerais, in a dispute with Vale Company and struggles against slavery-like work in monoculture plantations in various parts of Brazil. Along uh, with Medraza and Nelson again, he, they say, while it is important to honor and remember these struggles, we are convinced that it is necessary to explore their potential in order to link them to struggles directly directed against other areas of capitalist activities. In a sense, this would mean recognizing that indigenous ways of living and practices have to do with other capitalist activities. And similarly, what struggles for land have to do with other activities in seemingly distanced and unrelated landscapes. Thinking about extractivism in an expanded sense, these authors also highlight how it encompasses not only physical activity, but also the logistics associated with its financing, transporting, storage, and consumption, in a sense that encompasses the fields of logistics and finance. Logistics is the means of synchronizing and coordinating the movement of people and goods in space-time. Looking at logistics makes material connections between seemingly disparate logics, such as mineral extraction and the realm of finance. These authors also explore how capital is so dependent on its outsides that it's prepared to make considerable investments, for instance, in prospecting and research to ensure the constant reproduction of these outsides. It should be emphasized that these forecasts work with complex statistics and probabilities, so the imagined futures is framed by, by capitalist interests. To understand the intensification and expansion of extractivist industries in contemporary capitalism, particularly agribusiness and mining, we need an approach that is attentive to new sources of extractions that are emerging in activities such as data mining and biocapitalism. According again to these authors, and I quote, it is not only when operations of capital plunder the materi materiality of the earth and biosphere, but also when they encounter and draw upon forms and practice of human cooperation and sociality that we can say that extraction is at stake. In the sense of human soci sociability, we can think of digital interaction as a potential site of extractivism in this extended sense. An example of this is data mining. Although it, seem, it seems irrelevant to users when they click on terms of uses of websites and searches, digital behavior is tracked and recorded, producing big data. It is the logic of profiling based on algorithm calculations by tracking human activity uh, in digital environments, preparing the ground for subjective extraction, creating the potential to anticipate behavior, generate insights, and then create value. Data mining continues to open new frontiers for the expansion of property logics, blurring the boundaries between governance processes and capital valorization dynamics. 
Nilsson and Madraza, this point to the digital terrain as the new frontier being explored in neoliberal capitalism, based on voluntarily servile so sociability with extractivism. And according to David Faustino, we can also speak of digital colonialism. I, I, I won't draw upon it, but let's just keep this in mind, as new frontier of predatory extractivism through technology and the persistent effect of colonization. Also current in this first scene is the death is, is death as a driving destru destructive force of capitalism, where the politics and economy of death are the norms. Racism and xenophobia are then one of the major regulations categories of distribution of death in articulation with the juridical political structure of the plantation. Quoting Davidson Faustino, a sociologist from UNIFESP, we see the antagonism between high tech and high precision war and the uses of nomadic tactics with raids against the enemy which usually are populations not organized as militias that live, die in worlds of death of the 21st century, circuits of mineral and essential materials to extraction to feed military and technological revolution. In sum, I'm talking about the entangled history and practice of coloniality and in some territories, still direct colonialism, predatory extractivism, and whiteness. Scene two. I evoke now a second scene, just opposed and directly in dispute with the first one, that contrasts the colonial concept of nature and understands the co-implications of both body and territory in its profound relationship to maintaining the cycle of all lives. The concept of body territory, which comes from indigenous and Afro-diasporic movements, will problematize what has been divided as culture slash nature, and more importantly, can teach us how to navigate the death worlds of the first scene. As a desertion of, of the nature-culture divide, the body territory is expressed in non subordinative validation between beings and their interactions. It embraces multiple cosmologies outside of the monotheist para paradigm, which is, in the end, in tune with capitalism in all its mono-expressions, monotheism, monoculture, mono-language of nation-states, unidirectional arrow of Western time, monochromatic and stable identity imposition. Conjointly, the concept of body territory also problematized the commodification processes through recognizing full agency and knowledge production from non-humans in our web of interactions and considering spiritual interactions in this equation. It also means the articulation of anti-racist and decolonial struggles with the protection of the environment, which is so evident, which is not so evident both in racial and ecological discourses that frequently prioritize one of the terms at the expense of the other. Uh, indigenous curator Sandra Benitez clarified that territory does not refer to the capitalist sense of property, nor is limited to geography. She speaks of territory as the surroundings, that is, the land, the air, rivers, animals, plants, and the invisible beings that make Guarani, Guata, path possible. Earth is not only the land as soil, but, but all the surroundings the plants, rivers, the mineral worlds, and the spirits that sustain biodiversity. In sum, the entangled living aspects of beings, of all beings. Moreover, their interaction exceeds the Western understanding of contact and interaction. The work of Vandana Shiva emphasizes how Western reasoning relates to the world most from three kinds of contacts, by imposition, by friction contact and by force contact. 
From this body territory perspective, the primary need for territory also has to do with the possibility of positioning oneself in the world in dialogue with biodiversity. To have a territory is therefore to have the possibility of positioning oneself, of belonging to a surroundings or environment. It has then multiple senses, occupying space, having an environment and positioning oneself in the world. As each indigenous people tells its own story, the world is complex, full of different lives that coexist, giving a deeper meaning to biodiversity. The common line in any case is the intimate, reciprocal and mutual relation between bodies and territories. In short, between different beings of this nature that we are made of. It is important to acknowledge that the, uh, the non-anthropomorphic aspect of the body and that of Mother Earth too. As an example of that, the Kuna people relate the newborn's baby to a tree and the Krenak people tie the newborn baby to a plant. And I quote in Portuguese, Krenak, esse trânsito entre corpo humano e uma planta pode ocorrer com uma bananeira ou com uma árvore que vive 200 anos, não importa. O importante é o cordão umbilical ser enterrado no ato de plantar. Então, a criança e a planta compartilham do mesmo espírito. Territory, then, needs caring, healing, defense and strengthening, but in ways that we must tune with. As in the Podali project titled The Earth Asks for Silence, or of Gustavo Caboclo's work Ouvir a Terra, we see... Listen to the earth, listening grounds us, or coming to the earth, or turning into earth. This is one of the possible meanings of being an offspring of the earth, the ones that have a caring relationship to the earth. As a living being, earth is in dialogue with us, or to quote Nego Bispo's title of his book, book the earth strictly in anthropomorphic ways. So non-human agencies are active outside of the anthropomorphic frames and from narrative of the Anthropocene as white. Quoting Ailton Krenak talking about uh, Quilombola writer De Gubispo's idea of confluences, confluences, ao contrário do que estão fazendo, confluences invoca um contexto de mundos diversos que podem se afetar. In his critique, Ne Gubispo coined the term confluence, which also distinguished itself from convergence and divergence, common political terms associated in a binary form. Scene one and two should not be positioned in binary terms, but just juxtaposed. From indigenous and Quilombolas perspective, the struggle is that of finding confluences to find livable context and healing death worlds. Extending the territory struggle to the arts context, indigenous art practice highlight these drives to strengthen bonds to the earth through several forms. These practices are not free from predatory extractivism, extractivism within the art world and from academic contexts, but I will fo focus on their resistance and continuous bringing up of confluences, articulating the body territory in their means. Gustavo Caboclo is a Wapishama artist from Curitiba and Roraima, and his work connects these territories through his own fam familial stories, from historical narratives of expropriation of indigenous Wapishama people, and through materiality such as cotton threads, drawings, paintings, animation videos, narratives, and writing books. His works claim the right of collective Wapishana memorialization and reframing of indigenous narrative in art history and in art museums. His 2022 exhibition called Ouvir a Terra, curated by, by himself at Milan Gallery Sao Paulo, addresses through paintings, videos and installations, time and space dimensions of dislocation and migration of indigenous people, tying them to the need of listening to the earth. On the gallery wall, we read, 
Quando a terra firme adoece, é tempo de fuga ou escuta dessa terra? Tempo de plantar? Depressões e surtos flutuam. É que a terra, a terra. Mas ela insiste em falar com o mundo com orelhas sustos e todos os seres. Mais ainda, dia desses, ouvimos um eco em meio a tantas vozes. É que nessa conflagração, a Terra segue seu fluxo milenar de ser. The second art practice that articulates listening to the earth from the perspective of body territory is the Poladali project created in 2021 by the Baniwa community, community led by Cacique Luiz Laureano Baniwa of Itacoachara Mirim in the state of Amazonas and invited non-indigenous artists such as myself. Dealing with the direct conflicts of the invasion of their lands, the construction of the airports near the territory, and the loud sound of the thermoelectric plant Jaraqui, the Earth Asks for Silence was a graffiti inscription on the wall near the thermoelectric plant, a series of digital letters addressed to the federal political government of Brazil under Bolsonaro administration, also catalogued on the Instagram page, and graffiti workshops with the Banua community with drawings on a tree bark called Torori for an exhibition called Missivas Awakada Hi Pai Itata Ima Koita Keti. My Banua is not good. And the knowledge house, in the knowledge house. Podali means exchange, and is also a name of an important Banua ritual. This project was denouncing invasions of the Baniwa territory through different media. Together with the drawings and other actions, there were sound and video contribution from non-indigenous artists, and my contribution was a written dialogue called Escuta. Then you can see on Instagram, I'll, I'll skip that part. The silence that Earth asks for is either related to the pandemic year of 2021, denouncing and in the increasing attempts to invade by new community, not only on their lands, but also with the extremely high sound of the airport, which interfered the communication through sound, so important sense in the forest, and for Banua's practice of sharing dreams. The thermoelectric plank plant blocked their access to the river and substituted for showers installed in the community. Podali was then a site to communicate with non-indigenous people about the current and past violation and also a way to demarcate Banua's presence and perspective in the art world. I would like now to say a few words about time before concluding. How does predatory extractivism act on time? By imposing a commodity circulation time and a time that responds to finance. This is imposition of Western ca capitalist time, Kronos, and its greedy impact on valor valorizing the capitalist value despises and subordinates subordinates longer time cycles, such as river time that trespasses different territories. By the way, that's how Amazon company, not the river, profits, with the capacity of logistics to enter the commodity time of valorizations, as expressed in commodities just in time. Broadening this narrow concept of time, interactions between humans and non-humans are driven otherwise by indigenous people, dealing with the circularity of time and the strengthening of the cycle of all lives as important parameters of sharing and living in this world. Talking about death in his text, Cartographies After the End, Krenak states, Não vamos deixar de morrer ou qualquer coisa do gênero. Vamos antes nos transfigurar. Afinal, a metamorfose é o nosso ambiente, assim como das folhas, das ramas e de tudo o que existe. Or, as Caboclo puts it, a performance do tempo, este que quando não é linear e não temos controle algum, se apresenta para mim, para nós, enquanto ciclos de fio, fuso, fiar, plantar, rezar, semear, tecer, tramar, bordar. 
não estamos sozinhos. Por ora, seguimos fiando esse fio forte e atravessando o tempo até completarmos mais uma volta nesses ciclos de retorno à Terra. Cápsulas do tempo, sementes do bem viver. I conclude by saying that indigenous artistic practices can make us aware of possible anti-predatory extract extractivist perspective while demanding active listening as a strategy to navigate this complex, unequal and just opposed global scenario in which we have all moving positions of extracting or being extracted. By understanding body territory as a paradigm to which to relate and the interconnectedness of human non human interactions, perhaps we can open ourselves to deeply understand non white perspectives and proposed proposals of a shared future for us all. As Kaboku says, and I quote, the earth in each second tries to communicate with our presence not as an idea of separating as humans do, separating nature and humans, but in the sense of us being one thing. Maybe by emphasizing our connections, we can understand and fight for environmental rights as our own right to fully exist, and with that also address the damaging racialization that subordinates us to the people of the merchandise. So together with this indigenous and Kinalumbola knowledge, areas such as environmental humanities, eco-criticism, eco-feminism, and decolonial ecology can perhaps illuminate and collaborate to bridge ways to cope with the he hegemony of death worlds, also dismantling this gloomy future by taking seriously the act of heal and care. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Flavia. Thank you so much for this um, presentation. Just on time. <laughs> and I hand over the word to our guest, uh, Fernanda Peter, who will present to us on uh, her current work, and I'm trying to find the title uh, while she's setting up, um, Extractivist Practices Within and Outside of the Museum. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Yon. Uh, and thank you, you all, uh, for being here and uh, enduring uh, until this time. I hope I, my talk will keep you awake <laughs> and uh, we can discuss further on uh, different topics that uh, combine in our three uh, presentations. I was uh, invited to uh, present a work by uh, Brazilian artist Lucas Bambosi, which was, as uh, Thomas already said, uh, presented at the MAC USP, the Museum of Contemporary Art of the University of Sao Paulo um, in this first semester here in 2023, which I had the pleasure to uh, accompany and curate. And I uh, also propose to um, show you and speak about two other uh, projects that I am involved. One is a work uh, by the artist uh, Denilson Baniwa, which was presented in an exhibition I curated during the pandemic uh, at the Pinacoteca, uh, a work, uh, video work called Copenoye, and I will show you. And the third one is a project that I, is currently uh, being presented at Casa do Povo as a partnership between Casa do Povo and Macuspe. And that has uh, something that we are calling an experiment, an experiment on flight, uh, that is a series of um, visits uh, by the Tupinamba Cape uh, made by uh, the, um, the community of the Serra do Padeiro and uh, through the hands of uh, Glicéria Tupinambá. So I'll start reading, uh, so I keep track 
of time. And uh, first, I uh, will talk a little bit about uh, this project by uh, Lucas Mombosi. Then I'll show you uh, the new Zoom's video. And uh, in my last part of the talk, I uh, will present you the um, um, Cape in Movement uh, project. Well, uh, so Nostalgia is a proposal by Lucas Mombosi. Uh, a researcher, filmmaker, and visual artist who has been exploring a char characteristic of contemporary times in his recent words, works. So nostalgia, a term coined by philosopher Glenn Albert in 2005, the feeling of loss in the face of radical landscape transformations. Whether natural or urban, these transformations resulting from extractivism the intensive and extensive exploitation of the environment have consequences that are experienced as natural, um, as natural cast catastrophes, but are actually anthropogenic, created by humans. As a visual artist, Lucas Bambosi imagines this feeling, investigating its causes based on his experience with the landscape of Minas Gerais, the state where he, he grew up. Projections, luminous pa panels, digital image banks, and other devices give shape to this investigation, which also reflects on how to visually present the triggers of solostalgia, questioning our experience of being affected by these images. Hence, the artist exploits uh, various images technologies, the language of film and the central piece of the installation, which is this one, uh, so nostalgia, highlights eroded landscapes and mountains. The monumentality of the images creates a bodily impact and leads us oscillating between fascination and terror to enter the scenario of tragedies caused by mining in the region of Minas Gerais, which annihilate ways of life in the name of an archaic notion of progress. Uh, paisagens rasgadas, um, well, I forgot, to, uh, torn. 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 torned, yes, landscapes, presents images produced by aerial and satellite imagery, it's uh, the three monitors you see on the floor, uh, but satellite imagery that allows, allow access to the airspace of mining areas which is off limits to most in inhabitants of these landscapes. This work contrasts with the immersive perspective of the film. The objectified language of these records showing mining craters inaccessible to common cameras challenges the capacity for dissociation caused by these apparatuses and make us reflect on the active role of the scientific gaze in extractive annihilation. Monta Continuo uh, by Mola, a duo that Lucas and Fernando Velasquez uh, formed in 2013, I guess, uh, inscribes successive grooves on a mica plate, creating a symbolic scale so soundscape of perpetual erosive uh, processes. You see here just the uh, images that the, um, the mica, um, played on a, on a, um, on a disco uh, record. Um, uh, the, that image uh, forms this kind of uh, graphic appearance on the wall. Another video, Extra, 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 created from images published by press outlets, screen photojournalistic records of recent tragedies, natural disasters or actions of exploitation uh, from around the world. The, word the work inserts the situation on a global scale and questions the repetitive perception produced by the circulation of these images. Imprompt, the ones that you see uh, here on the, on the right uh, side of the picture, uh, the image is reduced to a semantic description directing what to see or imagine in the scenes as, a, as an inverse script. The installation is completed by the work uh, of three invited thinkers who present in loses 
text phrases that synthesize each of their ideas about solo nostalgia. New arts, uh, uh, new artist contributions in dialogue with the exhibition uh, were added uh, to the installation uh, through the Instagram page uh, of the project. So nostalgia is partially derived uh, from the feature film Lavra, which Lucas directed in 2021, and uh, who um, who has the contribution, which has the contribution of screenplay um, Christian Itasis and production by Andre Halak and Eder Santos. Uh, in his uh, statement for this exhibition, Babauzi, uh, uh, Bambauzi affirms that the maintenance of continuous extractivism is an ac anachronistic remnant of various forms of colonization that have taken hold of the world. In the current scenario, there is no clean solution for sustainable and minimally clean energy. A model of catastrophe has been established, crossing immaterial spheres and reaching the raw physicality of the planet's landscapes. This situation is particularly blatant in the areas surrounding Belo Horizonte, where mining is everywhere. Mapping and digital cartographies made visible what is hidden from the naked eye by berries of eucalyptus trees. The documentation often taking place um, challenging the airspace control by mining companies. He filmed uh, together with other people, this uh, mining areas, uh, which the airspace is controlled by the miners. If in the past, um, um, the what inside the earth was usurped, now uh, companies take control of the air and their damage become widely known through image the catastrophes of Mariana in 2015 and Brumadinho in 2019 being extensive documented. So, uh, the, of course, the images don't uh, make justice to the, to the installation, um, but uh, this is uh, part of uh, what uh, Lucas has shown uh, at the museum. And together with the exhibition, there was a series of activities, talks, and um, uh, workshops that were held uh, in, the, in the museum, expanding uh, the discussion around this uh, specific um, effort to highlight this kind of aesthetics of extractivism by this feeling of uh, Solastalgia. And um, I think uh, many issues raised on how to address uh, that feeling and that aesthetics through um, mining uh, uh, different technologies and um, aesthetics that come from extractivist uh, practices like mapping the territory, um, uh, data processing uh, information through uh, images and so on. Uh, the second um, project, this is another better photo of the Mika um, rotation and uh, the image that it, it forms. Yeah. Uh, the second uh, project that I would like to address um, touches um, uh, extractivism from uh, indigenous per perspective. It's a video by artist uh, Denilson Baniwa from the Baniwa people, and it was uh, presented in that exhibition that I mentioned. Uh, no, uh, no one would have believed. Uh, an exhibition that I curated together with Lauren Dyens, uh, um, researcher from Belgium. Uh, we did uh, that exhibition first in Belgium during the pandemic, uh, and then at Pinacoteca just after that, when, when the museum began to open up and we could uh, install the exhibition. Uh, we um, we uh, departed from a book by Alvin Correa, um, uh, illustrated by Alvin Correa, the book uh, which you may know um, that was written by um, Agatha Wells, 
uh, and its uh, narrative of uh, Martian invasion in Earth. And um, that book at the time uh, presented us a challenge that uh, would uh, have to do with giving or trying to find an image that could represent what we were uh, wanting on uh, with the COVID pandemic. And we found many different points of um, contact between our current present and uh, the book uh, in its um, uh, crazy fiction. And uh, the Nielsen made uh, this video that uh, speaks about um, uh, mining, uh, gold mining in the Yanomami um, territories. And uh, I think it uh, also connects uh, that event or that uh, current situation with uh, an explanation from indigenous uh, epistemologists of the pandemic itself. I'll show you the video, it's three minutes, I guess we have time. Um, oh, sorry, I had to do something with the... Oh, thank you, Jesus, guys, microphone key. Um, well, we could uh, discuss uh, many uh, uh, aspects of this um, 
of this work, uh, um, departing from the use of irony and uh, sarcasm to address uh, the tragic uh, situation of the uh, Yanomami, Yanomami territories. But I um, would like to point out um, the aspects of uh, um, presenting uh, an aesthetics of extractivism from an indigenous point of view. What is uh, the sensual uh, relation to the territory and to the transformations of the territory uh, made by extractivism and uh, the unleash of uh, uncontrolled forces that are uh, the exp explanation of um, the COVID pandemic uh, for uh, the Yanomami people. Um, um, I leave you with the English uh, translation that we made of that um, uh, poem that uh, Denilson um, uh, says uh, as a narrative of the, the film. And um, I think that uh, text also addresses a second aspect of extractivism that I would like to uh, address here now uh, with you, which is cultural. Uh, extractivism, not only natural extractivism, but also cultural extracti extractivism. As he speaks of um, um, the relationships of the art world with e extractivism, not only addressing um, um, a jewelry company that uh, is involved in the illegal mining in the Amazon uh, area, but also how uh, David Kopenhauer's book at the time was being praised by um, the um, cultural industry and uh, it shows Danielson's um, um, distance or uh, criticism of um, how uh, cultural institutions and the cultural world uh, is relating to uh, indigenous cultures and uh, indigenous art. So um, my third um, example here to you um, is uh, this project by uh, indigenous artist um, Gliceria Tupinambá, a project that um, is uh, a two-part uh, project, one that consists in an exhibition uh, at Casa do Povo, an exhibition that will be uh, on show until uh, December the 9th. And uh, this, uh, what we are calling experiment of the Manto in Movimento, or the Cape in Movement, which consists of a um, series of visits of uh, this um, entity, uh, the mental, the cape, uh, made by uh, Gliceria and the people uh, of the Serra do Padeiro. So I keep reading, uh, so I keep in time. Uh, the Monte Movimento project consists of a research exhibition and a series of visits by the Monte do Pinambá, da Serra do Padeiro, to spaces, communities, and institutions in the city of São Paulo. Organized by the curatorial committee made up of uh, Gliceria do Pinambá, Augustin de Twigny, Benjamin Sorussi, myself, Juliana Café, and Juliana Gontijo. The project also included the participation of Anna Druve, Caio Lescher, Laura da Vinha, and Liv Livia Vina Viganó, sorry, Olga Torres, and Gianca Molesi, um, among all agents, partners, and representatives of the spaces, communities, and institutions that demantle the Cape visits between September 3rd and December 9th, 2023. The group was carried uh, away by what Gliceria calls the spell of the thread, the power of the capes to call together people, institutions, and objects around it to follow its path of recovery. Monte Movimento expands the network already formed by Gliceria, Augustin de Twigny, Juliana Gontijo, and Juliana Café. They came together in 2020 to create the exhibition Asojaba Tupinambá, A Grande Volta Tupinambá, presented in Brasilia, Porto Seguro, and the Serra do Padeiro village in Bahia. The spell of the thread weaves more effective alliances. I quote uh, 
Krenak on this. And the group meets again at the invitation of Casa do Povo, an art space founded by the Jewish community in the Bon Retiro neighborhood in 1946, and Mark Uspi, the Contemporary Art Museum of the University of Sao Paulo, with the aim of bringing the clothes to the city, expanding the network of alliances. Instead of keeping it locked up uh, in a single physical space, reproducing a colonial gesture of appropriation, the collective proposal was to make it travel to find people, institutions, and objects to continue, continue weaving encounters. By aligning itself uh, with the Tupinamba struggle and resistance, the project, the project invites us to reflect on exhibition and museum methods and on the relationship between art, memory, and heritage from an indigenous perspective. The visiting experiment, which uh, the curatorial committee called the flight of the cloth or the flight of the main, the cape, consisted, consists of weaving relationships. Based on an invitation issued by the committee, a formal letter was sent to an initial list of leaders, spaces, and institutions chosen after discussions with the committee, within the community. Committee, sorry. The criterion was affinity and uh, emotional alliances. Glicera set the only condition that the places where the, where the mental would be welcome and those where the mental could feel good. A guest who visits, vid, visits their hosts and it's grateful for what they can offer them. A place to stay, food, a bed, a conversation. Based on this in invitation, negotiations were established so that the mental could be received in different places with a view to the care that the mental requires to be received with dignity. The visit could last a day or a week, depending on the possibilities of the host. The length of stay was always agreed, taking into account the av availability of the space, the affinity with its programming, the desire and opportunity to visit the mental to establish alliances, to join struggles, to exchange experiences. The project provided transportation and insurance for the mental, negotiating professional conditions for talks, lectures, and activities offered by uh, Glyceria and the committee. It was also important to engage in dialogue so that institutions with more conditions or resources could collaborate with the viability of visits to self-managed spaces and organizations. Everyone contributed according to their abilities. This aspect was heavily negotiated throughout the project and allowed uh, Glyceria to observe many dynamics in the arts and in museums in particular. Uh, lots of generosity coming from different uh, disadvantaged backgrounds uh, were uh, part of what uh, we observed with uh, this experiment. And um, the, ment uh, the mental, the cape, went to meet those, her those who heard uh, its call. During the months of September to December, the mental vis visited villages, museums, occupations, leaving from uh, and returning to Casa do Povo. Some of these visits were accompanied by, um, by the members of the curatorial committee, creating spaces for exchange, conversation, public talks, and debates. Uh, the Mantui Movimento projects is an offshoot of what Glyceria has been doing since the uh, 2000. Her work stems from a simple and powerful gesture while the return of the clothes from Europe were being negotiated, was being negoti negotiated, she asked herself the question, why couldn't the Tupinamba people who are still alive in Pindorama make a new cloth? And that's what she did with her village in Serra do Padeiro, with the elders, with the children, with bibliographical research, with expeditions to European collections, with allies and with the support of dreams and the permission of the enchanted ones. And here uh, you can so we can see a little bit of her uh, research in two big panels maps that uh, you have uh, at Casa do Povo, showing uh, the threads and the paths that she performed 
and still performs uh, to find uh, the known 11 uh, capes that are still in uh, Europe. <clears throat> Glissetta didn't uh, start it with uh, didn't start with the shape of the or, or the object, but with the gesture. She started to remember from in from the inside out, from the bird to the feather, from the knot to the mesh. What it means to make the cloth, following what she calls the spell of the thread, she created with the permission of the enchanted ones three clothes one that dresses Cacique Babau, another that is in the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro, and the third one that has landed at Casa do Povo and is visiting different uh, institutions in Sao Paulo. Uh, the project had, had put into practice a curatorial um, experiment that aimed decolonizing thoughts. In the Mountain Mov in Movement uh, project, uh, our methodology has been to provoke, above all, encounters between the mantle and its host sites. In these spaces, a zone of contact arises, as well as tensions. A challenge is launched for each space that is open to welcoming the mantle. For non-Indigenous institutions, the question arises, what is your contribution to the inclusion of indigenous researchers and their processes in museums, institutions, and cultural spaces? What are their efforts to contribute to dialogues and the construction of dynamics and practices of memory and heritage that strengthen indigenous peoples? Part of the project's challenge is to deal with the ways in which museums conceive their collections, their relationships with artists and creators, and their workers too, their collecting practices. We need to think about the relationship between institutions and those between institutions and people inside and outside them. We also did a lot of thinking within this project um, because museums and the people who work in, the, in them are very much marked by practices that reinforce the objectification of non-Western cultures. The museum is based on possession, competition, the contest for uh, originality and novelty. The project stressed these characteristics and proposed working on the fabric of the cloth. It invited reflection. Fernanda, posso pedir que você termine? Okay. Um, so where I go? <laughs> uh, so one of the uh, main uh, goals was to uh, inscribe in the space of the museum different ways of belonging, uh, not only uh, challenging the museum's urge to acquire, collect, keep uh, objects, but uh, to uh, present um, this experiment of passing through, as uh, Gustavo Caboclo would say, uh, institutions and collections, archives, uh, revolving uh, their methods and uh, categories of uh, relating to um, indigenous cultures. So I, I had two lines, but it, I'll close here. Okay, thank you. Um. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting you. I just um, didn't know where, where you would stop, so I thought I'd remind you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for these presentations. Um, as we already um, have progressed in time, I had prepared a little bit of a longer comment, but I will only really raise a few points, um, trying to make some connections and also to maybe just give the audience some time to um, formulate your own questions. I think. I really wanted to thank the three presentations because I think you took off where the description of the workshop left uh, ended, um, ba basically because you you took us a lot further than I think what um, was in the description. I think that's the best what can happen. That is um, just reminding us if we think of how extractivism was um, characterized for this workshop and how it is generally debated is the material process of capitalist accumulation, right? And it appears already in two nuances in your presentations. One, on the one hand, as 
ways of understanding hegemonic, uh, hegemonic ideology um, that is behind, as it is an ism, um, behind um, extraction as a practice, but also very much so as a criticism, which became very clear now in Fernandez's final statement on cultural extractivism, because I think the extractivism is being stretched, but it's stretched in order to make a statement, a political statement. Secondly, and that's what I want to focus on in my um, comments, is on the aesthetics, the aesthetical dimension of extractivism. And here it was said that it's both about the artistic representations in different media, but also the sensations and uh, sensorial um, experiences or the sens sensuous um, cognition. On the one hand, um, also thinking of the work that um, was kick kicking us off by Jörn, um, art can at times mainly be um, perceived as a reframing of extractivism and the ruins of extractivism itself. So basically, as a technique, as a particular way of also framing extractivism itself. Here, maybe there is, um, this is um, a very limited or, um, possibility of art, or one that is maybe mostly re remains in the realm of critical reflection, but it can be mu go much further as um, um, Jörn has shown himself and also the other presentations I've shown. And it can go all the way to um, the aesthetic dimension of extractivism, can go all the way to rethink of how we conceptualize, how we um, um, address or how we relate to the world as a sentipensar, for example, like the, the feeling and thinking together, uh, inextricably linked. And that brings us basically as a very basic question to um, what are the limits of extractivism? It goes back to a debate we had on Thursday. Uh, to what extent is it useful as, a, as, an, as a, an analytical notion? To what extent is it also um, need, um, to what extent do we also need to um, put limits to it? Overall, the question I had regarding the presentations and the overall theme, the aesthetics of extractivism, is the question of where the action actually lies regarding the process of extraction. Are people and territories that you address and engage with in your work merely reactive or also active? I think it becomes very clear that they're very active, but sometimes we think as if the, the, they were put into place only to react and to understand, possibly to critique, possibly mainly in the in, in this mode of resistance. And I, I, I really quite want to um, keep that as a main thought here in, uh, to think about the registers of both reaction and action, and how they unfold and to what extent we speak about a reaction to the fact of extraction of a, of a capitalist logic and to what extent you actually um, go a lot further to also think about actions that are unfolding and regenerating territories as um, Jörn at some point has said. Mm -hmm. And I think what um, Thomas said in his introduction that we might be invited to think of relations and the relations that constitute um, these tensions is already a way to, to move beyond or uh, explore the limits. I try to raise maybe three or four uh, main points. So one is, is um, aesthetics of extractivism just a spillover effect of the hegemony of economic relations or capitalism as it's become very clear? Um, clearly, we see that we see that even in the work of Astrid Oyoya, who describes renewable energies in her own work, who wasn't present, but she really describes that despite that being all a greenwashed, um, it's, it, she basically says that it's mainly a greenwashed form of extractivism. So that makes it very clear so that this logic is still around. Mm -hmm. mm. How would all of that change, or how how could we explore the limits more if you thought about um, the logic of relations, the re logics of um, relationalities, of healings, if we thought about a vocabulary that thinks about fissures, but also the mo the, bru uh, the processes of suturing, um, where the, 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 the damage remains seen, but something new emerges. So that is one. It is closely related to um, the question of the how the aesthetical dimension um, deals with asymmetries that are very much at the basis of the extractivist logic. This is global um, asymmetries, but also ontological asymmetries. How does um, how how do the two relate? How does aesthetics relate to asymmetries? How do asymmetries appear in the aesthetical dimension? To put it very crudely, how or to what extent? are hierarchies present in a plurality of aesthetic practices? I think that becomes very crucial because it's not that we, when we speak, about, when we turn to the arts that everything is all of a sudden amazing and beautiful and soft and healed. It's not, clearly that becomes clear in your own work. 
And how does, but how does also aesthetical practice is a potent register to address, critique, change the hierarchies that are in place? A third dimension that I want to briefly address is the debate we had about the extractivism, aesthetics of extractivism and depletion or exhaustion. And here I thought it becomes very clear in some of the narratives that Jan presented, but I think it may be worthwhile to think um, about the limits or the, the, this particular dimension, this particular characteristic of extractivism, the depleting aspect of the, the ex hosting aspect, if you think of cultural extractivism, ontological extractivism, etc. because I wanted to, um, we can see that um, when we change our conception of keys, then we all of a sudden um, step out of that logic of an end uh, of a limited resource and you get into a logic of the re remaking, the regenerating, the, the, the cyclical aspects of it. So that's, that's one. Mm. A fourth dimension that I thought was that I'm particularly maybe here I'm just selfish um, that I wanted to raise is the question of aesthetics and terri terri territory or territoriality. While it is sort of an obvious statement, right, that extractivism has to do with the materiality of land, of territory. We already learned from um, Flavia's presentation that te um, territory and territoriality is much more than the geographical reference or the material one. But still, I was wondering, um, is territory or territoriality a potent analytical dimension of your work? Or is it mainly a descriptive one? Is it a corrective? Is it a focus? Is, um, because it is so much more present in indigenous and ideology, um, ontologies and epistemologies. Or um, what, what does it do in your work for you? Because I think it's quite crucial because it's... it's it is a, it's an omnipresence in all of your work, but it's not always made specific what, 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 what it is that it um, brings to the debate. And I, I'm just, I think it would be really helpful, especially if you think about it in terms of the, the ontological dimension, in terms of the new materialist dimension of it, etc., and the artistic also um, dimension as a material practice. Last aspect, just to make it keep it short, is um, aesthetics of extractivism. And I struggle with it, and I think it hasn't become, it has become very clear, but I think I just wanted to leave it as a last comment, is sometimes it seems as if, if when we talk arts, that and if we shift to the poetic dimension, the aesthetic poetic dimension, that this is an intervention in and a critique of the political or the politics as in the capital P, basically the hegemonic capitalist, extractivist, modernist, etc., political project. Nevertheless, I think it's very it, it's become very clear in your presentations that what you've described as aesthetic practices are very much political, and I think that can be foregrounded because I think that's the moment when when um, it becomes even more explicit how the practices um, and the aesthetical dimension of extractivism that you have pointed to um, become a, an intervention in a very contested and, and, and in a very um, violent field. And I just wanted to make that clear because I always think um, it can't be said often enough that the poetic and the political, they sort of intertwined and come together. And sometimes this is necessary also in order for this not to be forgotten from a hegemonic point of view, because it can be easily sidetracked into sort of a placebo or a securing um, tactic rather than actually a full scale political project. Thank you. And now I'm chair and I invite questions in really any language that you want to raise, and I can help with translations if necessary. Who has questions? And we, ha we have a good half hour, like 35 to 40 minutes for a debate, which was the organizers wish to keep so much time in order to really engage in, a di in dialogues and critical engagements. Uh, I'll go very quickly then. The, Thank you. The shyness of the room. Uh, thank you very much. I was really delighted with the panel, uh, and I think Tillman did an excellent job of, of uh, summoning and putting together some of the points. Uh, Flavia, 
No. Sorry. <laughs> no, <sadly laughs> no. <laughs> Johan, uh, I would like to listen to you a bit more about this strange feeling that people feel going to this uh, old dams and you started talking about that and then you didn't have time. I would really like to hear more about that. And also about this very strange idea. Macarena also works a bit on that, on these different temporalities, like the temporality of the of the of the coal and of the oil as something prehistorical and how we burn this so fast. So, so I don't know if it's just metaphorical or if there's something more there, this clash of temporalities between the the almost prehistorical uh, 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 temporality of this material and how we burn it so fast. I think there's something there, but I don't know what. Uh, Flavia, thank you very much. Uh, I, I really loved uh, uh, the, the thing about the silence. And I remember like there is a project uh, where they, they're talking about uh, submarine noise caused by mining and how this is affecting wildlife in the oceans. And then you think like even deep in the ocean, there is this machinery working and disturbing everything. And, 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 and then if we're talking about statics of structivism, then of course we're talking about senses and the five senses. And your presentation really took me to this, uh, to the side of listening and hearing and what structivism produces and how it was before. You also mentioned how in the forest sound is very important for communication, maybe even more than, than visuality. So it's also about survival and communication. So if you could develop this a bit, I'll be very glad. Um, and then uh, my last question is both uh, is both for Fernanda, but I would be glad if you could also comment, Tillman, because uh, Tillman's question is very interesting. So we're talking about structivism, we're talking about territory, but then we go into this a bit more metaphorical, which I'm not sure if it's metaphorical or not, like cultural structivism and so on. And then what, what territory becomes also in this metaphor? Because your last part is, is, is it's, a, it's a moving territory somehow. I don't know if you could say that because this cape is traveling. Mm -hmm. You can also comment if you want to, <laughs> Flavia. And then tomorrow I'll speak a bit about this, but uh, uh, there is, um, Kids da Cunha is describing the, the Amazon River and the Amazon River transports a lot of uh, ground dirt, like earth material, a lot. Um, and then he's criticizing the river. The text is very, very strange, very interesting. And then on this, I see an image of extractivism, like this, this river that is taken away, that is destroying the land and is taken away. Of course, this is just Euclid just being crazy, but the image mm -hmm. is very strong. And then he uses this wonderful, this wonderful metaphor that the river is a traveling territory. Of course. But then structivism is also traveling territory in the sense it's like exporting nature, exporting soil. Uh, and that's also something you lose. You also lose it culturally together with the soil. If you could comment on that, uh, thank you. But, and then we pass to Guilherme and afterwards to Gloria. But we take um, Guilherme's question, then we have a round of questions, and then we have Gloria's and Spavras. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you, very rich. I have a, a, a quick con conceptual question, maybe, more uh, related to Flavia and your presentation, maybe. But I want to, to, to hear uh, something about, we are talking about extractivism and new extractivism. I want to know more about what do you think is the difference, what, what is new about new extractivism, new extractivism. And if there is a relation or if is the same thing uh, when we are discussing like historical uh, developmentalism and new developmentalism, we, we say desenvolvimentism and now desenvolvimentism. What's the relation between uh, these this concepts? Yeah, thank you. Let's have a first, let's have a first round of answers. Maybe we go um, from the back to the front. So I um, hope. Fernando, do you want do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Você quer responder? Ah, okay. Começar a responder. Oh, a gente okay. pega mais perguntas depois. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll start. Um, 
I'll start by cultural extractivism. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, I didn't I didn't uh, plan it as a metaphor because uh, what I uh, um, what I am interested in discussing and bringing into the discussion is that um, cultural practices, museum practices are part of what extractivism is. So what I call it coloniality or extractivism. And um, maybe I would uh, then uh, touch your question, is there a new, uh, a neo extractivism or it's a continuity of a project that comes with modernity and coloniality as the, um, the other side of the coin. Uh, so um, what I, um, what I uh, was trying to uh, talk uh, through this idea of cultural extractivism is uh, if uh, and how can we imagine uh, museum and cultural practices and academic practices that uh, reinvent or depart from uh, those structures. So this experiment of the of the this moving territory uh, of uh, the Cape, and I totally agree with you. It's a it's an idea of whether you have indigenous presence, you create that territory. So um, the idea of moving the Cape from uh, institution to institution, from place to place, is to experiment the possibility of creating uh, that territory and uh, making it visible. And uh, of course, the practice of making the capes have to do uh, or has to do with the territory, with the relationship with the territory, with what the territory can give now and how it can be uh, changed, recovered or healed through uh, that practice. Uh, Glicera, she, she always says, I, I'm calling this art because is that the way you understand? Uh, but what I'm doing is something different uh, that I am translating to you into this word that you agree, know, and, and praise. Uh, so I guess it has, it has to do with that. And uh, it has to do about creating presence uh, within uh, museums and within the cultural uh, world and the academic world, a presence that it, we can look at each other here and see how needed is that presence. So something, it's about it. <laughs> I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> Eu vou falar em português, porque aí, né, vai responder. <risos> o pessoal faz pergunta simples. É, obrigada pela resposta, Fernanda. Eu também estou totalmente de acordo com o que você está falando. Eu acho que tem um... É porque, assim, bota a gente para falar 20, 25 minutos, tem um monte de coisa que não dá para falar no sentido de... Da onde que eu estou falando sobre os conceitos, sobre os termos. Então, acho que agora é o momento de fazer isso. Eu acho que tem uma coisa que é muito importante de dizer, que é a diferença entre terra, território e territorialidade, que a gente fala como coisas iguais e são totalmente diferentes. Né? E aí, quando eu falo terra... Enfim, tem até uma passagem do Davi Copenau falando com um general, parece, do... É, nos anos 70, e aí ele, o general começa a falar, ah, não sei o quê, porque a terra indígena, não sei o quê, aí ele fala, ele está querendo dizer território, não é terra. Né? Então, é a terra nesse sentido de, um, de uma entidade viva, agente, não humana, não antropomórfica, é, que precisa ter direitos também. Né? Eu acho que eu coloquei isso um pouco no final da fala, como, assim como as, as pessoas 
precisam ter direitos né, para viver nessa, nessa, nessas sociedades extrativistas, e, e depois eu vou falar sobre isso, a, a natureza também, né? é, a, a, o ecocídio, o terricídio, que muitos povos indígenas falam, e, 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 a, e a luta por um direito mesmo da natureza, dos rios, da, dos seres, dos animais, é algo que está é, ligado a, a esse pensamento de terra como essa entidade viva. O território ele é uma negociação política para demarcação. A própria palavra demarcação ela é uma estratégia política para se relacionar com essa diferença de ontologia, né? do, do, da terra como entidade viva e, do, e de como se pensa no pensamento ocidental e branco é, o território, né? que é o mapa, o, né? a, a demarcação. Então, ela já é uma negociação. E a territorialidade está é, é, se referindo a esse direito originário né? é, na, na, na Resolução 69 da OIT, né? de que assim, indigenous people estavam aqui antes, de, de, por exemplo, esse, esse território pindorâmico ser... ser transformado em Brasil ou Latinoamérica. Então, está falando sobre esse direito a uma memorialização e também de é, ter praticamente é, considerada essa, essa vivência anterior ou, ou antes do, do, do colonial chegar de, é, dessas pessoas aqui. Como essa, essa tradição é uma tradição viva. Não é algo que, que se instiliu. Então, acho que isso é uma diferença fundamental para ter em, em, em mente. E uma outra coisa que eu queria dizer é que eu, intencionalmente, botei predatory extractivism como um termo, porque o extrativismo, é, a gente pode associar ele a uma, a uma retirada da natureza, a uma, uma, é, é, uma ação é, small scale. Né? E aí, para isso, assim, eu acho que o Nego Bispo fala melhor. Ele fala assim, ó, nós extraímos os frutos nas árvores. Eles expropriam as árvores dos frutos. Nós extraímos os animais na mata. Eles expropriam a mata dos animais. Nós extraímos os peixes nos rios. Eles expropriam os rios dos peixes. Nós extraímos a brisa no vento. Eles expropriam o vento da brisa. Nós extraímos o calor no fogo. Eles expropriam o fogo do calor. Nós extraímos a vida na terra, eles expropriam a terra da vida. Então, quer dizer, eu acho que a gente também tem que fazer essa, essa nuance do, do que, que a gente está falando quando está falando de extrativismo, porque não é tudo igual. Né? E, 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 e colocar o acento, essa, talvez a gente pudesse falar de um extrativismo, de expossessão, expropriação, é, nuançar melhor esses termos para a gente poder... É, saber do que a gente está falando, senão fica assim, ah, é tudo extrativismo, mas espera ali, vamos devagar com a louça, porque tem muita história por aí. Uma terceira parte é sobre é, é, extrativismo, neoextrativismo, isso está, assim, é, é, é a persistência de um mesmo fenômeno de destruição, de uma lógica de destruição, só que ela ganha diferentes momentos históricos. Então, o que é considerado neoextrativismo é justamente a transferência dessa centralidade de uma Europa colonial para um território asiático e para uma nova geopolítica é, né, a da China ou da, e dos novos modos de extração também. Eu trouxe o data mining e essa, esse, esse lugar tecnológico como esse novo lugar que o capitalismo inventa também nas suas pesquisas para conseguir ter os outsides é, de propósito, assim, para a gente entender essas diferentes lógicas históricas. Acho que o Jorn também fala um pouco disso, então é, é importante fazer essa distinção. Sobre o que o Tilman está falando de... Também falou... Muito obrigada. É, você falou várias coisas. É, é muito interessante pensar nessa, nessa, na sutura e na cura, né? O trabalho da Rosana Paulino, por exemplo, trabalha muito mais na sutura do que na cura. E daria para fazer uma, uma conversa muito interessante, inclusive para falar sobre o extrativismo, né? que a sutura é aquilo que você faz na emergência e que você vê os, os pontos aparentes, enfim. É, 
E, assim, sobre o poético e o político, eu, assim, de uns anos para cá, não tenho usado nem poético nem político, porque, para mim, tem ficado palavras vazias e muito ligadas ao entendimento filosófico, do que essas, filosófico ocidental do que essas práticas engajam, sabe? E, e eu acho que não dá conta. Assim, o que, que não é político nessa vida? A questão é como é, né? E mesma coisa para o poético. Também vou muito devagar com a questão de uma metáfora, que eu concordo com a Fernanda, que é tudo ação no mundo, é tudo intervenção no mundo. É, e aí, só para concluir, é, sobre o silêncio. É, tem um texto maravilhoso do Bruce Albert, que chama A Floresta Poliglota, que ele fala do papel do som na floresta e como que a, é, a, a, os Yanomami, em específico, se orientam a partir do som, e os Baniwa também, tanto para os sonhos quanto para ações cotidianas. Então, interferências nesse, nesse lugar mudam, mudam a possibilidade de vida, né? no, nesse lugar do som, nesse lugar da trajetória dos rios, mas, assim, especificamente sobre o som, é muito interessante esse texto, quando, como ele vai dizer que é toda uma. São diversas linguagens que estão ali. É, por isso que é a floresta poliglota, né? Ela fala de muitas maneiras, que a gente é muito pouco estimulado a ouvir na, na, na nossa ocidentalidade, né? Eu acho que o espaço da arte, nesse sentido, ele é um espaço privilegiado para a gente exercitar isso, mas também. É, é limitado, né? Porque está na vida, mas eu não vou falar sobre isso. E acabou. <risos> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tuna, and thank everybody. Also, thank the two of you as being one of the organizers here for your talks. Um, difficult questions. I mean, um, the question about the role of art and aesthetics, of course, difficult because. Um, we all know that art as free art is is some kind of 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 a european concept of modern european concept in deep relation with capitalism free art you take something out of context that's what already hegel says it might have a ritual function you take it out of context and that's art and then you put it in the museum and then uh, you 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 it may you may yeah you may look at it you, you walk around it and may get other other notions that you interpret it and there are of course other concepts art as agency gel and all the other anthropologic concepts of of what art is the the the, the act of isolating something from from a context be it ritual religious whatever makes it into art And I, I have no idea if this is reversible. I mean, all this idea of, 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 of a new uh, ritual um, uh, value of art, for my case, theater in the 60s, from the 60s here in Sao Paulo, also like groups like uh, Teatro Oficina, but also in the United States, Living Theater, Grotowski in Poland. It's, it's, it's highly interesting. And maybe, maybe, you can, maybe you can get out of it with, with Latour saying this is just other You can say that's art, it's isolated, but it, it goes into other new uh, quasi-ritual contexts. But there's something very, very, um, uh, very disturbing about the role of art in all this, and that's what I, it's cultural extraction, also what I try to say a bit, art is there to train the new post-industrial uh, subjects, they should go to the dance performances to, to develop their skills, and um, art should train new relations, But then you into relational arts, Burio. But then again, who curates those spaces? Who can go there? Who can afford to go there? Where does the energy come from? Who cleans up afterwards? All this question of an institutional critique of art. Then new and the new discussions transformed into infrastructural critique. They're highly important. Uh, that's what I wanted to mention, um, Ladam and Yukilis, and that's of, you know, of course a long discussion about it. I think the role of art is highly, highly um, ambivalent. Nevertheless, I think that the notion of that's the basic notion of aesthetics, as I see this, that the way that the world is perceived, and 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 world is also constructed, worlding as Haraway would have it, 
I think that's really something very important when we talk about extractivism. We cannot only talk about economy because then we are already in in a way. We have to, to, to and that's uh, when I want to be optimistic. And I thought you brought wonderful examples here. There's another role of art. Uh, yeah, so sorry to but, but <laughs> so, okay. So I can't answer your question. Do it on, on no, coffee. No, no, no. Oh, okay. I thought you were looking. No, no, no. no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. This is, but this is even more difficult because this is also out of this when 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 the things get out of context, when they become art. That's what Krivet is interested in, and that's what happens now. Of course, they have they have, they all have functions. You can see it. You can see, somebody can explain it to you the function of all this, but you. There are tourists in the rural area, the former workers show you what it was, how it worked. But there's something else that is transmitted. And, and I'm interested in what this is, what this uncanniness, what this dizziness is, this violence. And I could talk a long time now here, but I, I, would, I would propose to go back to Benjamin. And when he says that around 1500 Reformation time, it's when also the conquista began, Christianity was transformed into capitalism and a new like a new whole new idea of, of 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 credit and guilt was was developed and the idea of fate and then he says fate is the violence of nat nature in 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 in, in history in, in the Baroque in the book on the Baroque and 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 then later on he takes us up and talking about the 19th century about this huge infrastructures the ironworks the railways he says it's a strange feeling that everything that's just a few days or a few years old is antique. It's immediately antique. How does it come? And I think it's it's this kind of of of, of temporality that has to do with 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 credit economy, with fate, with guilt. Could talk hours about it. Could give it Benjamin. I won't do this though. That that comes back again in the in the in the, in the passage uh, in the archives project. He's he's looking for it there. He's researching it, but he's he's researching this where this dizziness come from, where this idea of an immediate. Uh, antiquization of those those ruins of extractivism comes from, and I think it has to do with this overlapping times of progress and and those immediate contact with all this. I have to imagine Timothy Mo, uh, Mitchell writes it somewhere. I had it in the introduction, but I don't have it here. How many cubic meters? How many years? I think it's forty five years of, of 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 life on Earth that are burned in one year. And these are the numbers from 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 eighty nine, and I think this this is there's this this uh, this this credit global credit economy guilt context burning burning everything progress and burning all what's left from pre prehistoric life. It's somewhere there, but I have to I would have to talk hours on Benjamin to to get closer to this. Oh, thank you for the question. <laughs> thank you, and I didn't <laughs> want to interrupt you. So Gloria now, then yes. Barbara, and then Berit. Yes, well, thank you very much for your presentations, quite interesting. Um, I have a question for you, too. Um, maybe from another, for a different perspective, but do you have idea the, how many how many art places uh, were in the in the area? How many uh, the number of activities and, uh, for instance, and had it uh, or has now uh, an impact in the social and in the cultural life of the area? Mm -hmm. That is the question. Thank you, and Barbara. Yeah, thank you also, and it's also a great continuity to, the, to our discussions last week. Um, my perspective is more focusing on socio-environmental perspective on extractivism. And if you look at extractivism, and I like very much uh, what you said, Flavia, because of course there are multiple uses of a non-human environment, but the, the, the issue of extractivism is the system in the sense of being a coupled system um, and the irreversibility is irreversible, mm -hmm. um, and the fact the fact that you are isolating an element of environment, evaluating it and disconnecting it. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an issue of rupture and irreversibility, um, and um, it would be interesting to think. If this is the same, if you look, for example, at collecting institutions, mm -hmm. um, I would say yes, 
because if you look at anthropological collections, you're disconnecting, reconnecting, you are really mm -hmm. taking one element out and putting it and evaluating it in mm -hmm. very specific ways. And that means uh, that you make a lot of other things invisible. So extractivism somehow put at stakes our notions of temporality and speciality because it's a conflation of past, present, and future, somehow. The cold example is a good one. Um, but we can have many others. Um, and um, I think this is something that is, at least for me, it's complicated to think of, because um, uh, in my more ethnographic studies, where I did also ethnography of mining companies, mm -hmm. Um, but basically you have also, if you would include, for example, geologists or whatever, you have uh, is solar pamiento, you have overlapping and fragmentation of different cartographies, mm -hmm. I would say, and temporalities. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are always different um, glasses <laughs> on how to look at. And um, in that sense, um, my feeling is that extractivism is a huge machinery of making things invisible. Mm -hmm. And yeah. also are temporal and even are spatial. So, 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 so the logic behind that, um, if you look, for example, how political decision makers speak of mining pro projects, no? Um, and in that sense, um, I was thinking about the non-visible, the non-perceivable, the limits of translation. Mm -hmm. um, because if you look, for example, at the salas and lithium mining from the local perspective, it's one type of extractivism. If you discuss with those guys having to negotiate energy transition in the Green Deal from German side, for example, it's another look at lithium, but still, <laughs> they're talking about lithium. Mm -hmm. So that was something I was somehow thinking about the limits of what you cannot translate. And this is a little bit related to the difficulties to grasp from an anthropological point of view concepts such as art and aesthetics, who are also specific strategies of making something translatable. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, maybe you can reflect on that and relate it to their different knowledge practices because all what we are talking about in anthropology you would address it as different knowledge practices somehow mm -hmm. to put it in very general terms no mm -hmm. knowledge very broad and um, um yeah um, thinking about those cartographies Glicidia Tupinamba will be next year in berlin at the Haus der Kulturen der Welt. So it would be, it would be interesting project to compare Casa oh. do Povo and, yeah. and HKW. Mm -hmm. Just in that sense of the question that came up for me, the in, yeah, this nomadism, but at the mm -hmm. same time, the limits of translation. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you again. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Oh, we are moving back. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd take you. Um, thank you very much from, from my side also for uh, your inspiring talks. Um, I've got a short question uh, for Jörn. In different um, moments of your uh, talk, you mentioned um, the aquatic element, and uh, I found this very interesting. The, the aquatic, the aquatic element, water. water. And water. I found this very interesting. You showed also the, the photographs, the map of uh, the Ruhrgebiet as, uh, as the Inlandschaft. Um, so I was um, I was wondering, or this project of um, how did you call it um, artificial reconstruction of the riverbed. So I was wondering if um, there's a special role of of water in this project of um, aesthetization of of um, this area, um, also in the in the um, sense of of the sensorial of the senses. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Barrett. Is there any other question? <laughs> Sorry that I'm saying, but I've forgotten one point. Nobody of you spoke about technology. Sorry, but I was thinking that you cannot understand extractivism without technology. Yeah. So it's a whole technological system. Infrastructures <coughs> have been mentioned, mm -hmm. but maybe that would be also interesting to reflect mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, you spoke. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
<laughs> okay, so I give each one of you two minutes to respond. Tá bom. É, uma coisa que eu esqueci de falar, que tem a ver com isso que a Bárbara está colocando, eu achei muito interessante essa ideia do extrativismo como é, tornar invisível, inclusive porque isso é uma das características do pensamento ocidental, pensamento branco. Então, eu acho que tem muita coisa para explorar aí, muito interessante. E por isso que eu é, agora coloquei... É, um pouco sobre a dimensão temporal, não deu para falar muito, porque eu acho que a temporalidade faz a diferença entre se um traveling territory vai ser extractivism ou não. Assim, eu acho que isso é, é um marcador muito importante para a gente entender, porque assim, não dá para, eu acho, assim, não dá para colocar no mesmo pé de igualdade a ah, é, mining é, também é um... É um é, traveling Territory, como o Manto do Pinambá. É, é, eu acho que é... Mas tem a ver com essa temporalidade. Talvez isso seja uma chave para pensar essas diferenças. E a outra coisa é... é eu, de propósito, coloquei entre, em cenas 1 um e 2 e sugeri que essas cenas estão justapostas, porque eu acho que essa é a temporalidade que a gente vive, como você estava falando de qual é o óculos que você lida com isso. Né? E aí eu acho que o esforço é mostrar as entangled histories and practices desses diferentes, dessa justa posição, desses diferentes óculos. Eu acho que é, um, é algo que eu penso muito sobre, como mostrar que é entrelaçado e aí, por isso que colonialidade, para mim, é uma coisa muito importante, porque ela dá muitas chaves para pensar isso. É, e, então, é, essa, justamente tentar pensar esse, esse, esse entrelaçamento vai começar a dar, por exemplo, respostas por que a tecnologia tem a ver com o lítio, tem a ver com é, é, é essa cadeia logística que está ligada a essa temporalidade que está no neoliberalismo ligada às finanças a financiarização do capital. Né? É essa temporalidade que, é, que assalta, que expropria tudo. E aí, assim, senão, é, o papel dos governos é esse de é, barrar, ou de pelo menos conter. Né? Eu acho que esse limite da, da tradução tem a ver com isso. Quais são as negociações feitas e qual é o papel do Estado dentro de, de um Estado que serve ao bem social e não um Estado neoliberal. Né? Eu acho que fora das regulamentações, realmente não tem, não tem muita saída, mas talvez advogar mais e mais por esse papel de um Estado que, que cumpra, inclusive, as, as regulações que já estão aí, né? os regulamentos que já estão aí, seria importante fazer. Pronto, acabou. Obrigado. Ian, você quer continuar? Ok, yeah, thanks. Uh, obrigado. Um... Yeah, the glorious question. How, the, the question was how many places were there before? The, 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 a lot, still, always a lot, always a lot of theater, a lot of working theaters, a lot of. Um, this, this, the thing is that the structure changed with all the state money coming in um, to build new centers like in the Zollverein or the festivals, huge festivals, the Ruhtriennale, the choreographic center. This, this attracted another scene. This attracts an international art scene. And so the, on the local. Th Theaters are more into nostalgia, doing doing what oh life was great when we were still minors and all this. And this is a, a strange divide. And the the the, the high end art institutions they do not deal at all. Now they now they started like two years ago. The Pak Tolfa and the huge dance center made a first festival on 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 extraction or whatever. But for for a long time they're sitting there on the former mine and doing like international dance whatever high and stuff but there are a lot and there's still a lot but there's a bit a, a division the, the 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 local actors didn't really like all the huge projects coming in but but it's it's yeah and it's extremely dense i think it's had most for theater it has more theaters than than paris and london together the region it's, it's extremely dense um second thing about knowledge yes definitely you can also talk about knowledge but i would always say yeah that's why i love so baumgarten so much the census cognition knowledge is not not only something that you know but it also affects the way you sense the world and perceive the world so there and there are aesthetics come in so we can discuss a long time if you're talking about aesthetics or knowledge but i think they're inter, intertwined um 
uh, about water. Yeah, thank you. This is very, very interesting because there's a lot of money in this. The huge, because the Ruhr is a very tiny river and there's no, there's five million people, but it's always, it's huge. And it was always this tiny river. So huge infrastructure about water, securing water. And then the Emscher where all the, 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 the sewage went in. The reconstruction of the Emscher is an intergenerational project. It's not, no, they've got this pumping station. They planned in 68. It's open in 21. It's, and it's, it's, it's a, a colleague of mine who is a curator was there, particularly the Ruhr Verband. Nobody knows of them. They earn heaps of money because they're, they're responsible for freshwater access. And this is highly interesting. There's an artist, a young artist I know, Alina Schmuch, who's made uh, working about the sewage system with, with cameras. But very interesting. Project. Another artist, uh, um, Daniel Kötter, it's kind of problematic work, but also interested in all this water supply of the region with, with um, virtual reality. So I could uh, tell. This is this is really interesting. That's not been a huge pro, uh, pro, uh, part in the um, aestheticization of the, the remnants in uh, in the EBR Emscher Park yet. It's more technical, and the edification was more the the huge construction that the cathedrals and all this. But now new artists like also deal with it. What was the final question? Technology, yes, of course. Technologies, um, uh, technologies, and also cities. We were talking a lot about, uh, of course, about indigenous territories, but here we're also living on in, in ex uh, uh, an environment covered by extractivism. So, Paulo, the whole the whole idea of the city is to transport coffee, coffee from the plantations to Europe, <laughs> and that's how the infrastructures look like. So, I think we also have to be aware that extractivism is not something that happens in some remote places. But uh, thank you, Jan. Um, Fernando, final words. Um... I'll begin agreeing with you the, the question of uh, extractivism being a system. But uh, what I was trying to address is that uh, that system has, um, it, it's the same, uh, we can connect the, the system, the economic system to the cultural system because they both depart from the same separation, which is, um, which is uh, the polarization of, of subject and object. So uh, what is, it, is in, at stake uh, in the experiment with this or what Glicera is doing is uh, it's not, uh, and that's why I, I disagree or I have a problem with the idea of uh, healing or uh, cure or because it's, it's a bigger effort of uh, having a strategy of uh, shifting paradigms, uh, which is addressing this dichotomy which in the at the bottom of those systems and operations. So uh, when um, when Glicera is uh, doing her research uh, through uh, European um, uh, institutions and museums and, and, and uh, collections, the, the question is to awake technologies that are there but not uh, visible or not um, practice it. So it has to do uh, what, uh, with what she calls cosmo te techniques uh, that come from this encounter with an agent, and that new materialism comes here. That that object is an agent that uh, tells, that um, teaches uh, how it is made. And that knowledge, which is sensuous, which is practical, uh, can can come again in the body. So uh, it's about uh, awakening the objects and breaking this separation between subject and object, uh, which is at stake, and that's 
why I think art is here crucial because it is, uh, a, we can say, a model of, uh, of knowledge that can overcome uh, what science has separated and what uh, economy has dilapidated. So that's why I believe the importance of art. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much um, to all of you, the panelists, for these um, presentations and also the debate and for your questions. And I wish you a good coffee and come back here in half an hour. <laughs>